the events that were transpiring. Let's review a little bit so I can know where you guys left off. Can we do that? Last week we talked about um, Hellenism, yes? And Judaism, right? What did we, what did we discover? We, discuss. We drew a how Greek are you spectrum. Oh, did we? It's like, uh, so, like, uh, what's it like? Ooh, like this. Like a scale like this kind of thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Herodians on one side and the Essenes on the other, and then Sadducees and Pharisees, and talked about. So you said the Essenes right here? Or it, it, was, it was the other direction, but it was not, so as not to confuse people. It's going to confuse us. Confuse yeah. us. On the left is Greek. <laughs> and you were, you were right over there with the Herodians. I was, I was a Herodian, right? Now, the time period that we're working on, there are no Herodians yet. But we're going to get to the Herodians. So we said there were Herodians, and they said there were people who were ready to, to become Greek. And then there were the Essenes on the other end. Who, who, where did we end up? Where did you put yourselves? I'm a Pharisee. You were a Pharisee, so the Pharisees are right here. Well, of course, we're Essenes. Right here, right? The Sadducees are more Greek. The Sadducees are kind of more here, right? So this is our Pharisees. We played up the tension and how do we deal with it. This is a tense time between Judaism and Hellenism. What are we supposed to do with it? Yeah. The Jeremiah principle. Yeah, did you, just talk, did you read Jeremiah? Mm -hmm. Jeremiah principle. That what, what did God tell the people of Israel to do? Are they supposed to rebel against the king of, of Babylon? They're supposed to obey the, the rulers that are over. It's called the Jeremiah principle. And it lasts for almost 500 years. We're going to kind of get to see the context in which the Jeremiah principle gets ejected. Because that's what it's going to be. You can see why it would begin to lead to us going, we can't obey these people. Because there's this tension between the Pharisees, who are somewhat Hellenized, and the Sadducees, who are pretty thoroughly Hellenized. Right? Uh, did we draw some conclusions to our own world? Did we figure out where we are? Yes? No? Maybe, kinda. Mrs. Flanagan skipped ahead. She hit the punchline in like minute five. I was like, <coughs> <laughs> she's like, well, how does this play into our world? You know, we have to deal with this stuff. I'm like, yes, exactly. And then I was the point in teaching, but <laughs> yeah. right. It's it, this is something that's actually very interesting for us to talk about. Hellenism is the big deal in this world. How are we going to relate to it? We are the Hellenizers of our world. America is the Hellenizer of the world. We do this through a couple of ways. What? Television. Internet. Right? Movies. Military. Military. And business. Right? Why do you think people, why do you think teaching English as a second language is a big deal? You think it's just because people are like, oh, I just love the English language. I want to become fluent in it. No, why are they learning English? Yes. So what? To better themselves. To, you can actually enter into the world. You can become an international person if you learn English. This is difficult for us to recognize. We are the Hellenizers. I'm not saying we're bad. I'm not saying we're evil. I'm not saying we all need to run out and learn Spanish. What I'm saying is to recognize that. That's what we are. We are the Hellenizers. In a lot of cultures, we're causing things that are very similar to this. Not the same. But we're causing things like this. Make sense? The groups that are going to become the Essenes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees started with what they were talking about last week. What I have for us here today is you can take this, you can fold it up and put it in between Malachi and Matthew if you want to. No one has to, of course. I mean, it's your Bible. But <laughs> you can put this between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew. And what we're going to do, you're going to need this for the next couple of weeks, because what we're going to do is we're going to walk through, because you'll see here it starts in, uh, it says, Onias III is replaced by Jason as high priest. That is 175 B.C. And it's going to take us all the way down to Mark Anthony and Octavian Civil War in 31 B.C. Okay? You may actually have plenty. Um, here's another pile here if you need more. Um, so this is something you can just keep in between, you can fold it in half and stick it in between Matthew and Malachi. These are the things that are occurring between Matthew and Malachi. We haven't entered into Jesus' world yet. We're kind of getting there. But what we're doing is we're giving you a whole lot of background knowledge. Why do the Pharisees and the Sadducees hate each other? Well, this is part of it. 
These are people who have different ideas of what it means to be a Jew. Different ideas of what it means to be a follower of God. So they're going to develop and they're going to continue on. Our scripture today is found in Ezekiel chapter 40, verses 46. If you want to turn there, we're going to read this. So um, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but this is kind of our Bible outline thing. So uh, we start in Genesis, which is a creation. And then Genesis chapter 3 has the fall. And then God selects Abraham. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. That gives us the whole people of Israel. He has 12 children. Gives us all of Israel. Much of the Old Testament is all about how these people of Israel interact with God. We come to the New Testament and we have Jesus' resurrection. His, his mission, his birth, his mission, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And then the book of Acts through the rest of the, of the Bible is all about how the church handled post-Jesus. How it handled the world um, after Jesus. And so then we have the second coming, which is the book of Revelation. And it's talked about briefly in some of the other passages. Where we are is in the book of Ezekiel, which puts us here with the people of God. He's a prophet in the Old Testament, and he's akin to Jeremiah. So what he's giving us in Ezekiel 40 is he's giving us a description of the temple. Okay, He's describing what the temple's going to look like for the Jews. And remember, for the Jews, they're centered around the temple. Temple worship is a big deal. So this is what Ezekiel said. Outside the inner gate, within the inner court, there were two rooms. One at the side of the north gate and facing south, and another at the side of the south gate and facing north. He said to me, the room facing south is for the priests who have charge of the temple. Now this is the key part here. And the room facing north is for the priests who have charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok who are the only Levites who may draw near the Lord to minister before him. This is actually a crucial element, okay? One of the Essenes' big things, which hasn't happened yet, but one of the Essenes' big thing is, to be a priest, you need to belong to the line of Zadok. One of the reasons the, the Essenes pulled out of the temple worship is because the, 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 the Zadok line is no longer in charge. Now, this isn't a big deal to us. We're kind of like, ah, you know, who cares? But you've got to think, at the, at, in terms of the temple, this is a big deal to them. This family was, by a prophet, 300, 400 years before this time, had said, this line is going to always minister to God. And so this became a key element to them. And what we're going to walk through, kind of how the Zodok family line gets kicked out. Which uh, gives us our seeds. All right. Questions, comments? Are we ready to do this? Walk through everything we got? Let's do this. All right, so, Onaeus the third. Okay, Onaeus the third. I want you to notice a few things. Jason is, uh, what kind of a name is Jason? Is that a Hebrew name? Let's turn to the book of Jason, chapter four. What kind of a name is Jason? Jason and the Argonauts. It's a Greek name. This is a Greek name. So, Onaeus is, um, is, um, Jason's father, and uh, Jason replaces him as high priest. Now, what Jason is doing is he is the one who actually authorizes the creation of a gymnasium. Now, remember what we talked about a gymnasium? He authorized a gymnasium to be created in Jerusalem. Not just in the surrounding cities, actually in Jerusalem. He created bathhouses. Jason does this. He creates bathhouses, he creates a gymnasium, they create a polis. Do you remember what the polis was? What is the polis? It's a city state. Yes. They create a polis inside Jerusalem and they call it Antioch. Jerusalem's polis, they, call, they would call it Antioch at Jerusalem. That's what it was called. It was a polis inside. So you've got to think of it like a people within a people. Okay, And Jason is the one who really begins to push this. He says, hey, we can interact with people. Hey, we can open these things up. Now, what do, I mean, we, we got to think this through, guys, okay? What do um, pagan people buy? What kind of things might they have in their home? Idols. Idols. So if you're inviting pagans into your city, and you're inviting them to go to your gymnasium, and you're inviting them to be a part of it, what does that mean people are going to want to buy? They're going to want to buy idols. So what do you have to have? Idol makers, right? People are going to make your idols for you. 
So what has Jerusalem essentially done? It's opened itself up to idol worship again. Now what happened to the Jews? Uh -huh. right? I mean, so think this back. Think through the stories of Jeremiah. Think through the stories of, of, uh, of uh, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. What were these people doing? Making Asherah poles. So this process is inviting these people in. Jerusalem is trying to enter into the larger culture of Hellenism. We may not think it's cool, but, but these worship of these multiple gods was out there, and it was a part of it. And Jason is the one who is driving this forward. He is willing to have idol, idol worshipers build things there. He's willing to have a gymnasium. He's willing to have bathhouses. He's willing to, the word would be, Hellenize. So where would we kind of, where would we seem to put him over here? Is this, because remember, Pharisees and Sadducees haven't quite developed yet. Where would we put him at? He's pretty Hellenized, right? There were, Greek, there, were, there were Jews who wanted to do more. There was a group called the Tobiads. Zodok, anyone got Zodok there? There was a group called the Tobiads. The Tobiads, they wanted the whole deal. They thought that the Jewish religion, the Jewish people were backwards. They thought they were hicks. They thought they were uh, uh, incapable of functioning as they were. They wanted to, the people of Israel to be just like every other nation. And they wanted to full-on Hellenize. So are, these, are these Jewish people? These are Jewish people. And you gotta, you got to remember, there's, I mean, it's a, there's this slide rule, right? The more wealthy you are, What's it going to give you access to? Education. The more educated you are, the more you're going to learn Greek. The more you learn Greek, the more you're going to be exposed to its thoughts, its ideas, its philosophies. It's going to affect you. So the, wealthy, the, the, the wealthier you tended to be, the more you were willing to Hellenize. The poorer you were, the less willingness to Hellenize, right? So the Tobias were fairly wealthy people who were wanting to just throw Israel in with the rest of the nations. And they keep pushing Jason to go further and further and further. But he's not willing to do things like put idols into the temple. They'll have idol worshipers or idol makers in, in, the, in Jerusalem, but he won't let them go into the temple. He has kind of got lines. He has standards. There's only so far Jason's willing to go. How far is he willing to go, though? I mean, let the think of his name. Right? His name is, is Greek. So how Hellenized is he? So what does it tell you about the Tobiads? Right? You got Jason, who's pretty Hellenized, and the Tobiads are saying, you're not Hellenized enough. Further, further, further. We need more. We need to be Hellenized more. We need to stop becoming the people that are kind of crazy little lunatics on the side. So Menelaus, who may or may not have been related to, there's some questions about whether or not he was related to uh, Jason. Menelaus goes to, goes to Antiochus IV, and he says, these people, with these guys in support, we are willing to go further. We want more. We want to be Hellenized more. Well, like, you got to kind of think, the more Hellenized you were, the more benefits you got, the more help you got from the state, right? The more you opened yourselves up to trade with the rest of the world. Jerusalem was kind of this weird backwards place where, like, oh, I don't know if I want to invest there. You see how that would work? Why would I invest there? These people are crazy. They only worship one God, and they cut off part of your male parts. Why would we want to do that? And so the Topia is like, yes, yes, but we're working on those people. We're going to change them. And they go to Antiochus, who is the, um, the ruler of the, uh, of the Seleucids, and they say, we are willing to go all in. And as long as you make Menelaus the high priest. Now, the high priest was kind of the role of like a governor. All right? So Menelaus says... We're going to go all in. But he ends up, and he has to bribe the king, right? 
because they already have a functioning high priest who's ready to do what he wants to do. So he offers a bribe to Antiochus IV. Guys, this is how it was done in the ancient world. You bribed and paid your way in. He, he bribed the king and said, if you make me high priest, I'll go all out. Here's some extra money to sweeten the pot, right? I promise you this amount of money to sweeten the pot. Menelaus says, or uh, Antiochus says, okay, you can become high priest. So he goes in and deposes Jason from the high priesthood. Now, he has to make good on his what? He sweetened the pot. Where's he going to get the money from? Didn't have the money. So guess what Menelaus does? He goes into the temple and he takes the golden resonance, the golden cups, the goblets, the things that were supposed to be there that were dedicated to Yahweh. Yahweh. He takes those and sells them and gives the money to Antiochus. Why? He has to make good on his promise, right? So he starts grabbing these things, and Onaeus III, who is Jason's father, screams, you're robbing the temple. You are robbing God. You're taking what is dedicated to God, and you're giving it to a pagan, Hellenistic, terrible king. We're God's people. We're supposed to be separated. So... Menelaus, working with a Greek who was associated with Antiochus IV, lured Onaeus out of his home and murders him. Onaeus, the former high priest of the Jewish people, has now been murdered by the high priest of the Jews. What are you thinking? You're a Jew. Where are you at? <laughs> we think of all this. We haven't even done anything yet. We're just dealing with how Menelaus became the... Uh, became the, the high priest. What do we think of this? Good thing, bad thing. Wow, we're really going in. We're going to change direction, right? I'm not looking for the next one. <laughs> He's not got my vote. They don't have a choice, right? The people don't have a choice. He was appointed by the king. They murdered Onaeus. They've taken it over. Menelaus says, we're all in. So they decide that they're going to rededicate the temple in Jerusalem to Zeus. Let me say that again. They're going to rededicate the temple in Jerusalem to Zeus. They set a statue of Zeus up in the Holy of Holies. And they say, Yahweh and Zeus are the same thing. We're all just worshiping the same God. We're all just following the same God. You worship Yahweh. His name to you is Yahweh. To us, he's Zeus. So we're all worshiping the same God here. We're going to stick his idol in the temple, and then everybody can come and worship Yahweh slash Zeus. Doesn't this sound awesome? <clears throat> right? This is what he does. He goes so far as to sacrifice a pig on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. They are determined to force the people of Israel out of their reclusive, backward beliefs and force them into the modern world. That's the language that they would have used. That idea, that concept, that we're, that's the idea that they would have used. We're going to force you to behave like we want you to behave. We're going to force you to comply. You're going to do what we want you to do. So then Menelaus begins with this reign of terror. They begin hunting down women who circumcise their children. And if they circumcise them, they kill the children kill the women and hang the dead bodies around their neck. This is what Menelaus does. We're going to force the people to stop circumcising. Sure, you can stay Jewish. Stay Jewish. It's okay. You're a Jew. You've always been a Jew. Just because you don't have the old snipperoo doesn't mean you're not Jewish. You can stay a Jew. So he starts murdering women who circumcise their children. <laughs> How are we doing now? Where's my pitchfork? <laughs> Setting me up for you know, batting cleanup. You're batting cleanup, right? Yeah. Remember, in all of this is this Jeremiah principle. This is this principle that God says what? Kind of like in Romans, respect the authorities that I place over you. Right. These people are in charge. You listen to what they have to say. And now the Jews are in this crisis. We've respected, the, we've respected the rulers. We've let them come in. We've let them stick Zeus in our inner city. We've let 
let them dedicate this. We've let them build idols within our city walls. We're letting them smear themselves with oil and run around naked. We're letting them have games within our cities. We're letting them do all these things. And what is happening to our Jewish population? What's happening to us as a people? <clears throat> being annihilated. So they have to start making a choice. So, part of Menelaus' deal is he wants everyone to pinch incense, pinch an altar to the gods. Remember, his goal is not to murder people. Okay? His goal is not to murder people. Yes, it sounds horrible he's butchering women, but he wasn't butchering women because he liked killing women. What, what was he trying to do? Just play nice with the Greeks. He's what? I'm sorry? He's making an example. Right. He's making it a bad idea. Don't go through with this. You don't want to do this or we'll murder you. He's not trying to kill women. He's trying to force the Jews out of their traditions and into something else. Join the rest of the world. That's his goal. His goal is not murder. But he didn't exactly realize how, how this thing was all going to play out. So he sends troops into the surrounding area of Israel, and they're trying to get the locals at the local level. This is no longer Jerusalem. This is stuff that's at the local town level. They're going to towns, and they're demanding that the local leaders of the towns sacrifice to the gods, to the Greek gods. And then they'll be able to participate like everybody else. So they show up in a town called Modin. And an old man there, probably in his 40s, 50, late 40s, early 50s, a man there by the name of Maccabee was an old man. He had like seven, seven sons. And he shows up there, and the Greeks show up with, their, with a, a very small retinue of guards and the leadership from Jerusalem, and they say, we're going to sacrifice. So here's what uh, the Macca Mr. Maccabee does. Can't leave his name off the front, first name off the front. It's not Judah, because that's his son. Matthias. Matthias Maccabee, that's it. Matthias Maccabee shows up, and he... The, the town leader is going to sacrifice to God. He's going to do what he's supposed to do. Matthias Maccabee grabs a sword, slays the Jew who was about ready to sacrifice to this idol, and kills the Greek messengers as well. And he says, all who are zealous for the law and for Yahweh, follow me. And he and his sons take off for the hills. Right? They've murdered the um, Antiochus Epiphanes uh, messengers. So they go off into the hills, and this is what starts the Maccabean revolt. Okay? Matthias Maccabee revolts uh, at 66, 68 to 66 BC. He dies only two years into the revolt. I mean, the guy's living in the mountains, hiding in caves. How long do you think he can do that? At 50, 60 years old. But his sons pick up the rebellion. Okay? And the rebellion keeps going. Matter of fact, they're, it turns out that the Jews are actually pretty good at warfare. And it would be what we would call asymmetrical warfare. They are ambushing troops when they're maneuvering. They are ambushing people's supplies. They're not attacking them head on. They're ambushing them. Uh, Israel's really healing. So they're hitting them in asymmetrical warfare. They're fighting them as terrorists. They're actually pretty good at it. They get to the point, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes dies in 164. And Antiochus IV Fourth, the fifth, discontinues all of this. He says, this was a crazy idea. Menelaus is deposed. He actually ends up getting executed because his policies led to a revolt in his, in his area. Yes? Who is Antiochus IV and V? Antiochus Epiphanes is the fourth. He is the king of the Seleucids. Do you, do, do we talk about how the... The guy that put the, the Menelaus in charge. Yes, he's the guy. Men, uh, Antiochus IV is the one who put Menelaus in charge. Because, at least as far as we, some people will say that it was driven by Antiochus. Most historians say actually it was kind of driven by Menelaus, who was trying to please both directions. Okay, that's, most historians go to that place. They think Menelaus was the one who was driving and Antiochus Epiphanes, who by the way was an egomaniac. And he believed he was divine himself. So, I mean, it's not like he was some kind of preacher in the choir, you know. I mean, he, was, he thought he was divine. So this all kind of fed into his ego anyway. So it's kind of this, Menelaus and he have this kind of sick symbiotic relationship, right? We're going to worship you as a god along with the other gods, and we're going to Hellenize to a very great extent. Uh, 
Judas Maccabee is the one who picks up the revolution from 166 to 160. If you're interested in knowing how all of this works out, you can actually read the books. First and Second Maccabees tells all of this. It tells the whole revolt from their perspective. It is not a canonical book, um, but it is in the pseudepigrapha that Catholics will sometimes have in there, in their Bibles. This is the Maccabean revolt, and it changes, it changes the Jewish people. Okay? Because what do you, to be Matthias Maccabee, what are you going to have to do to that Jeremiah principle? Right? You've got to get rid of the Jeremiah principle. We're done. Not because we don't want to follow God, but because what? They do want to follow him, and these other people are making it almost <clears throat> impossible to follow God. So this Jeremiah principle gets sacrificed in the altar to God by Matthias Maccabee. And this becomes the model, guys. The Maccabees did not just kill Greeks. The Maccabees killed Jews who collaborated with Greeks. That was kind of their method. So Menelaus was murdering women who had their children circumcised, right? Murdering them. Uh, they actually was brutal stuff, like things that I don't want to talk about. Murdering the women who had the, the, their children circumcised. It was all designed to, to send this message. Well, the Maccabees sent their own message. Guess what it was? Circumcise your kids. Well, let's just circumcise your kids. Collaborate with the Greeks, and we'll break in your home, and we'll kill you. That was the Maccabees' response. So you have Menelaus's about two, two years of Menelaus's murdering Jews who were, who are um, not collaborating with the Greeks, and you have the Maccabees who are murdering Jews who are Crazy. collaborating with the Jews. This is, a pretty, this is a pretty common practice for the Maccabees. What do we, what do we think of this? Sound like a fun time to be a Jew? All's fair in war. And it's, they, they considered them traitors, just as we would have in a war situation. Yes. Imagine if we got, it's hard to, to picture this because we're so big, but imagine if we got invaded by like Russia and Cuba. Like who saw um, Red Dawn? The movie Red, um, I guess I'm being myself. But Russia and Cuba invade America and they cut it in half and they take it over and there's these groups called the Wolverines and they fight off the Russians and the Cubans. But the idea is imagine if we've been invaded and the invaders have the power to take money from you, they have the power to tax you, they have the power to take what they want. They're the government, they're the authority. But they're not of us. They're of something else. And your neighbors, like, man, I just want to be able to get along. I want to be able to send my kid to college. So what do I got to do to send my kid to college? What do I have to do? Well, you've got you to sell your goods to this guy because he'll pay the best price for it. He'll give you a lot of money for it if you sell him. All right, all right. Got six girls. They say, if you give us four of your girls as prostitutes, we will give you a ton. Guys, this is, what, this is reality, okay? This is how this worked, okay? We'll give you a ton of money. Ton of money. What do you think the good Jews thought of that? Right? Is this really what? They're not taking your girls. They're prostituting them. And the other option is slavery. And the other option is slavery. We just take them from you. The end. It's going to happen. We're just going to take them from you. You see how this works? Brutal world. Brutal time. Very difficult time. Jews are having difficult decisions they have to make. The Maccabees will kill you if you collaborate, and the Greeks will kill you if you stay Jewish. It's a very difficult time to be a Jew. They are actually relatively successful. Um, I didn't tell you the story about how... Um, um, uh, we'll talk about this with Rome. Uh, we'll talk about Antiochus Epiphanes when we get to Rome, because um, there's a story here about how Antiochus Epiphanes uh, kicks out uh, um, Jason and puts them in the layers back in. It's very, very interesting the way the whole thing works out. Um, so the Seleucid War, Demetrius um, uh, becomes king, and Alexander Bailey's is the contender, um, and Jonathan is made high priest. Now, he is not of the Zodok family line. Jonathan is a Maccabee. They are so successful in this revolt, we're going to be here, this is around uh, 152. So this is about uh, 14 years after the revolt. The Jews are actually so successful in their revolt, they kick the Greeks out, and they begin printing their own coins. Now, as if you know anything about anything, if you can print your own money, what does that make you? 
your government. So the Jews were actually un um, independent enough that they could print their own coins, they could send money out, they were actually their own little nation. Um, part of what they did, uh, when they were able to do that, they actually ended up appealing uh, to Rome, and Rome told the Seleucids, you're gonna back off and leave these people alone, because we don't like you picking on them. So believe it or not, the Jews actually appealed to Rome, and they kind of made a partnership, uh, alliance with Rome, which kind of ended up in this pseudo-independence. But what you'll notice is that Jonathan Maccabee becomes high priest. He is not of the Zodok family line. He's not a Zodok. He takes over the priesthood, and they begin to be in charge. Now the next few years is what's going to happen is we're going to discuss as this thing develops, now that you're in charge, guess what you have to actually do? You got to figure out, okay, so how do we be a successful nation? How do we, how do we thrive in this world? If you skip down just a little bit, you'll begin to see Alexandria, Aristobulus, Alexander, these are Jews whose names are Alexander, Alexandria, who are from the Maccabean line. What does this tell you? Maccabees become Jewish too. Become Hellenized Hellenized, too. Yeah. It's just part of that whole thing. You get in power, it's really hard. Like Hellenism was tough. It was everywhere. It permeated everything. So Jonathan kicks out the, 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 the Greek influence, sets up their own little nation, and one or two generations are all being Hellenized all over again. This is what Hellenism did. So this gives the Jews, it puts to bed the Jeremiah principle of don't revolt. It puts that whole thing to bed. Jews have revolted. They had independence. They were their own nation. They had their own, their own ability to, to print their own money. They were able to take charge and run their own world for just a little while. And this changes the Jewish people. They go from, hey, um, we're, you know, we have to be, a, we have to listen to people who are over top of us to, we don't have to listen to anybody. We can be free and independent. And what do you think this is going to lead to when we get up to Jesus this time? <clears throat> They're looking for someone to lead another revolt against the Romans. Yeah. Who, by the way, was their partners, right? Rome was, Rome was a funny little character. When we talk about Rome, that'll be some fun stuff. Because Rome was, a, Rome was its own whole new set of different problems, okay? Rome partnered with, with the, the Maccabees, partnered with them, told the solutions, hey, back off. You leave them alone. Don't mess with them. They're our buddies. They're our pals. You think Rome was doing this because they were just a people who were just interested in the freedom of others? That's a poker chip they can turn in 150 years later. Yeah. That's how this works. All right, so this is the Maccabean Revolt. What do we think? Let's, make, let's help you guys make sense of this. That's how it starts. That's how it goes. Um, it changes Judaism. Jews are now murdering other Jews who are collaborating. What, what are some ways that we would describe this? What does this sound like to you? Fun times at Ridgemont High? I mean, it sounds like the modern Middle East or modern mm -hmm. Venezuela, you know, oh, well, Maduro's in charge because he's a people's man, but then so-and-so is friends with the big empire and they put him in and then there's a revolt. Or, you know, you've got, okay. or, you know, these people control the <clears throat> desert at night, but in the daytime, the governor's armies march through and, you know, he, he's gassing people, but then they're chopping off Christians' heads and it's like, ah! Who's side my on? Mm -hmm. It sounds like almost every um, cultural slash political struggle that's gone on for every you know, <laughs> for the last several hundred years. Yeah. It, it, it's the same sort of setup. Um, it's just consistent. Nothing ever really changes. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Yeah. This sounds like South Africa. 
in the 1800s, 1900s, right? It, it's almost Afghanistan of the last Afghanistan. 30 ask, years. Oh, so yeah. Ask Russia, ask us, ask whoever who's had to go in and out of there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It just makes us realize that, you know, the, the like, post World War II peace that at least the industrialized nations have had is kind of the exception and not the rule in human relations. Yeah. It doesn't take much. People want their way. They want to get their way. And money, and power, and philosophy, and culture drive a lot of this problem. Where would you have been? Who are you? Are you a Maccabee who's running the hills, killing fellow Jews who refused, who are collaborating? It's, I don't think it's the point or deciding which side you're on. It's when you change sides. I think that's what we do in our current culture. Okay. What, what is that moment that you said, okay, I've had enough? And that's what all of them were going through. It's what, uh, in Germany, the, the people that were with the Nazis at that point said, okay, I've had enough. I mean, they, they had to see what really happened and say, okay, mm -hmm. that, okay, you know, it's that point at which you turn away. I think that's the question more than where to fall. It's yeah. when do I fall? You know, when yeah. do I make this choice? So a couple weeks ago I asked you, are you going to teach your kids Greek? Remember that? I asked, are you teaching your kids Greek? How many guys agreed that you said you were going to teach your kids Greek? You got to, right? I mean, this is the world that we're living in. You got to know Greek. Okay, so you taught your kids Greek. You, you, what you're saying is very apropos. Where's the jump? Where's the jump off point, people? Where's the jump off point? Where do you hop off that Greek train? When they sacrifice it, it, the pig on the altar. When they sacrifice the pig on the altar? That's kind of when you're like, okay, I, I we can't do this anymore. I'll turn up my nose at the gymnasium, but I'll move on with life. But yeah, something about the temple is kind of a bridge too far. It wasn't for the people of Israel. It was or was not. The revolt doesn't happen the year that he does that. It actually happens about a year and a half later. So the people of Israel lived with that. Were they waiting for somebody? Were they like, we're just looking for somebody to stand up to these guys? And the Maccabees kind of like gave them that? Or were, or were they like, oh, it's just the temple, it's okay, we're, we're going to be able to get through this? Were they thinking at the time, because they were still looking for the Messiah, that, that Maccabee was... The, the, the Maccabees, they talk about the Messiah, and uh, I, think it's, I think it's Judas, who, by the way, was a brilliant... He was, Judas was the brilliant military commander of all of them. He was actually like the middle son, but um, uh, Matthias turns it over to Judas, who's actually the brilliant commander. Um, he said, I'm not the Messiah. He, it was something he, he literally, you're, I'm not the one you're waiting for. Never claimed to be the Messiah, but you can see how the people. The fact that he says that tells, tells us that that idea is around. You see what I'm saying? The fact that he says, I'm not him, tells us that at that time, people were looking for him, for the Messiah. If this tells you anything about his importance in history, uh, George Handel, who wrote, who wrote Messiah, his second most famous work as an oratorio is uh, Judas Maccabeus. Mm -hmm. Judas Maccabeus. So it's, this, is, this is the defining revolt in between the two testaments. It's the defining things. Judaism changes from Old Testament Judaism to New Testament Judaism. This is why when you, this is why when you uh, read when you read um, Ezekiel and you read Jeremiah, they're all like, well, this idea is about the eternity and God and, and we're going to be his people and we're going to follow what, what th these things happen. We're going to worship him. This shifts in the New Testament to people who are this close to revolting virtually all the time. Mm -hmm. They're this close to revolt all the time in the New Testament. And uh, when Jesus feeds the 5,000 in John, right? You can go home and look that story up. Jesus feeds the 5,000. In, in the text it says... They were going to forcibly take him to Jerusalem and make him king. He just fed the 5,000. 
they were like, this is our dude. This is our man. We've got our guy. We don't even need him to make, <clears throat> to, have, to have plant crops. He'll just make us food. This is the perfect guy. That's how close they were. And that's not middle, that, that's not ju the Judaism of intertestamental Judaism. The, the Maccabees are the ones who shift all of this. The Jews get a taste of freedom. They get a taste of independence. They get a taste of what it means to be their own, their own nation and guide their own path. And it all kind of goes downhill. Because <laughs> what happens, we, we haven't had a chance to talk about it, but what happens to Onias and Jason and Menelaus happens to the Maccabees within a generation or two. Hellenism was that powerful. It was that difficult to deal with. What are some things we take out of this? What do we do? What do we, what do we take out? What does this mean for us today as believers? One, I think it helps us understand the New Testament a little bit better. Okay? When we're talking about the zealots, the zealots are standing in a very long line of Maccabees. Okay? Simon the zealot was who? One of Jesus' followers. So what's that tell you? Matthew, the tax collector, was who? He's a collaborator. What does it tell you that Jesus had a disciple named Simon the Zealot and Matthew, the tax collector? What, what do you think those dinner conversations were like? <laughs> right? It's all about politics. <laughs> okay with religion, no politics. Right? That tells you something about Jesus. What else can we learn? What can we take out of this? The story's not just, um, it's not just about understanding the New Testament. Do we see some of ourselves in play with this today? This week in the news. This week in the news? I mean, um, I've been following lots uh, of what the Catholics are saying about Cardinal Dolan right now. Oh. Because of the stuff that's going on in New York with the partial birth abortion and the fact that he is not excommunicating. Yeah people that that many Catholics are calling upon it's that it's that point of them saying you're not doing your job so what what does it happen what happens he's he's basically says I can't do that that's a political issue I can't break into that so where is that it's almost like hell Hellenization there can can I do the job that I'm supposed to do and, and, and so now you've got a lot of people that are angry with him and, and so we're seeing this Play out in, in different ways. Yeah. Not only that, but the United Methodist Church has three choices to make. Yep. Yeah. One time, you just remember. It's hard because you have to think at every step. Okay, this step is okay, but you know what is next? What, what's this next? When do you get off when, the bus? When well, does it go too far? Well, when does it go too far? When do we hop off the merry-go-round? And your children, too, you don't know, but can you take responsibility for that? But Onus the third can say, okay, I'm not a Greek. I'm the high priest. You know, the temple is sacred or whatever, but what the Germans come and I'll name my kid Jason. You know, what's the big deal? He still serves Yahweh. He still circumcised or whatever. And then your kid Jason, he goes to Greek school and stuff, and then, like, he, like, he goes the next step. You're like, whoa, that's where I drew the line. But the next generation might draw a line in a different, one different place. <laughs> Guys, I think this is a, This is an important thing for us to recognize. Um, we're not alone here. We think of ourselves as living in a time and in a culture that's unique. Like we are suffering with unique problems. We are not unique. We are not suffering unique problems. These are problems that all cultures have had. Every Christian, every believer, every strong follower of God comes to this point where you say, am I going to cave or am I going to, or am I going to stand up? So our problems are not unique. I think that's a great takeaway. We're not the only ones who've ever gone through what we're going through. We're not the only ones. We've got to figure out, however, to learn from these people. How do we learn from this? So I'd say, you want to have a good time? Go sit down and read the book of Maccabees. I've kind of given you some context for it. You can kind of read it. It's a great book. Read about the revolt. Read about what they did. Read about how things went. And in the background, you've got to keep remembering, Hellenism is just banging like a big old sledgehammer. And it's just calling to them as a people. Father, we're grateful for this opportunity. We're grateful for, the, for Matthias Maccabee and the, and the 
and the example that he gives. Lord, I don't know that I would have done what he did, but Lord, he did something. Help us as your people to find a way to be true to the gospel. We're thankful for these stories. We're thankful for how it helps us understand the life and times of Christ. We ask now that you take us home. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys. So we got you keep this thing in your Bible. It's a great thing to have. Did I see your papers? No, I got it.